I always feel so powerful when that happens, and I know it has nothing to do with me, but that's all right. Hello, everybody. How are you? Great. Welcome to the finale. The finale. Can you believe that? That's been six weeks. The finale of Fish Trap Reads. We are now wrapping up six weeks celebrating Molly Glosses, the Jump Off Creeks. And so, yay, absolutely. <laughs> So my name is Shannon McNerney. For those of you who don't know, I'm the executive director of Fish Trap. I wanted to tell you a little bit about this. Since 2006, Fish Trap has hosted some kind of community read, sometimes through the NEA Big Read Program. Sometimes we choose our own book with a, long, a strong either local tie or kind of resonance to our local community. So this year, y'all recognize this one? Yeah? There's some for sale back there from the book loft, by the way, I hear tell. So if you don't have your copy, get one tonight. Uh, this year, we, this winter, we were absolutely unanimous. We have a little wonderful community uh, committee uh, that meets about the Big Read, and our star member, of course, is our own Elizabeth Oliver. But we met uh, this year to talk about uh, the, what book we wanted to choose, and we were unanimous in our decision to pick the Jump Off Creek by Molly Kloss. <laughs> so... Why did we do this? Well, this book has it all. It does. It has it all. No pressure. It has it all. It's set in our backyard of the Blue Mountains. It tells what we think is a familiar story from a really unfamiliar point of view, as in the point of view of 50% of the population or more. Um, and it's also written by a longtime friend of Fish Trap. For all of you procrastinators out there, the Jump Off Creek is the unforgettable story of homesteader Lydia Sanderson and her struggles to settle in the mountains of Oregon in the 1890s. The Jump Off Creek gives readers a really intimate look at the hardships of frontier life and a courageous woman determined to survive. Again, the book looks like this. Just because we're wrapped up doesn't mean you need to be. So please join us later. Molly, of course, is with us tonight, but you can catch up on all of her, both her previous presentations and then the great content that we got from the National Historic, or National Historic Oregon Interpretive, Oregon Trail Interpretive Center. I think I got that. National Historic Oregon Trail Interpretive Center, who've been wonderful to work with this year. You can find all of that, plus uh, anything else you want to know about the big or this year's Fish Trap Reads at fishtrap.org or on the YouTube channel. So you can also record and watch all these recordings forever. Can you imagine binge watching Fish Trap Reads? <laughs> you can do that. You can actually binge watch the last couple of them if you'd like to. So you can watch it now anytime from a classroom. If you're watching online, please join us there. By the way, Facebook Live folks, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And you can also watch it tucked in your bed, tucked in with a cup of tea. So you can have tea in bed with Molly. <laughs> So over the last six weeks, Fish Trap has provided more than 400 free books and learning resources to schools and libraries from Malau and Union County. This is largely due to, to so many of you who make donations to Fish Trap each year, but it's also to a bunch of wonderful people who I'd like to um, thank tonight. So especially our friends at the Book Loft, Community Bank, Oregon Arts Commission, Pacific Power Foundation, and the Bronze Antler Bed and Breakfast. So please give them a hand. Thank you. <laughs> We also have wonderful program partners, including the Joseph Enterprise and Willow School Districts and Libraries, Building Healthy Families, the LeGrand School District, Art Center East, Eastern Oregon University Library, the Cook Memorial Library, and the Historic Union Community Hall. And special thanks again to the National Historic Oregon Trail Interpretive Center in Baker City, and one more person, Molly sidekick, Betty Houston. So thank you so much for joining us. Who is here tonight? So thank you, Betty. I also want to give special thanks to the Fish Trap Board and to staff in particular. I want to call out Mike Midlow, who, who led the, the, the curation of this year's program. So please give them a big hand. <clears throat> I also, while I have a second, want to acknowledge um, some of you know our own lovely Hunter Weaver has decided to leave us, which we are very sad about. So please, when, yeah, exactly, boo. But when you go buy your special adult bait tasty beverage, please give her a big hug. But I also want to welcome Jessica Boglin, who joined us this week. So she's here tonight as well. Okay, so let's get to the finale with our special guest, the author of The Jump Off Creek, Molly Gloss. Pay attention. Following Molly's talk, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. We're going to do a Q&A. Those reusions, we talked about this before. Questions start with, 
who, what, why, where, when, and how. And they usually end with an upslope. Uh, anecdotes are, are lovely, and you can share them after the program, okay? So that would be lovely. If you're joining us live on Facebook tonight, we want to hear from you too. We have some people who are monitoring that, so just type your question in the comment section, and we just might ask it live. No promises. Be appropriate. Molly Glass is the author of several novels in addition to the jump off creek including the dazzle of the day wildlife the hearts of horses and falling from horses as well as the story collection unforeseen she writes both realistic fiction and science fiction and her work has received among other honors a penn west Fiction Prize, the Oregon Book Award, two Pacific Northwest Booksellers Awards, the James Tiptree Jr. Award, and the Winning a Writers Award. Molly is a fourth generation Oregonian and comes to us tonight right here, right here from our own stage. Welcome, Molly. Wow. The lights. Surprise. <laughs> yeah. I can't see any of you. Maybe that's good. I don't know. Um, what I can see are two really bright lights in my eyes. Um, thanks for inviting me. Um, thanks for choosing the Jump Off Creek, you know. Um, that book's been in print continuously since 1989. And I'm continually astonished that new readers are finding it after all this time. I'm just astonished. Um, I have talked about, um, I've given two talks already, and in both of them I've suggested different things to do with the writing of that novel and tonight, so I'm going to um, try to find something new to talk about. <laughs> um, and then we can engage in a conversation afterward with Q&A. So this is Women's History Month. I guess you all know that, right? And so I thought I would start off this talk um, by talking about a little collection of essays called Writing a Woman's Life. It was a book that was an early influence on my writing life and in some ways helped to shape the novel that became The Jump Off Creek. Carolyn Heilbrunn was the author. In another life, uh, she was the mystery writer, Amanda Cross. But she was also an academic. And in this book, this was an academic book, she was laying out a thesis about women's biographies, how to write a biography of a woman, and how to read one. And she was also, I think, exploring a complex metaphor about the way women live their lives, the way we write our lives, um, our own lives, in a sense, by writing an original script, or more often by following the script we've been handed by social conventions. Her book, among other things, looks at some celebrated women who didn't follow the traditional expectations for a woman's life, who managed to free themselves to pursue the life they'd chosen rather than the life scripted for them by their society or by their times. Georges Sand, uh, for example, dressing as a man was one of her subjects. George Eliot, living openly with a married man. Virginia Woolf, marrying a man of distinctly lower social and intellectual rank. And it occurred to me, not when I first read Heilbrunn's book, but later, that she might have also meant or included a woman like Lydia Sanderson, going, to, going west to homestead on her own, and all the women, the real women homesteaders, upon whom I'd modeled Lydia's life. I spoke early this month about these women, the private writings, the diaries and journals and memoirs of the Western women who were a model for Lydia and the fact that the stories of these women's lives had mostly not been the subject of novels. In one chapter of Heilbrunn's book, she spoke about the gaps in literature, subjects that are seldom written about in fiction, and how most of those gaps are centered on women. Friendship between women, for instance, or the complexity of a happy marriage or the expectation or the experiences, pardon me, of women 
who don't make a man the center of their life, or what it feels like for a woman living into old age. And she wrote about women's proneness for dreaming happy endings. If he notices me, if I marry him, if I get into my dream college, if I get this manuscript accepted, as if with just this final thing settled, the way will be swept clear for happiness. But endings, she wrote, are for romances or for daydreams, not for life. And she spoke about the importance of telling the truth, of writing a true story, even or perhaps especially if it's fiction. I know that consciously or unconsciously, when I set out to write The Jump Off Creek, I was writing to close one of those gaps she spoke of, a gap in Western fiction. I wanted to write the book I hadn't been able to find on the library shelves, a Western novel that centered a woman. And I wanted to write a true story, even if it was fiction. So what I'm going to talk about tonight are some of the novels that have been an influence on my writing life, my writing about the West, Western novels by women as well as men, novels that were trying to tell a truer story about the West. The Jump Off Creek has often been described as a women's Western, but there is, you know, a parallel men's story in that novel, Tim and Blue's story, which intersects with Lydia's story at actually only a few places. The men's story and the woman's story define each other, it seems to me, in ways that wouldn't have been possible if I'd stuck to only one. So let me talk about first the books that influenced the men's half of the story. This is, a, this is something I've talked about often, so maybe some of you have heard me say this before, that I was around 12 years old when I fell in love with the books my dad was reading, the cowboy novels of Zane Gray and Max Brand and Luke Short. I had a child's view of the world then, and the adventure, the clean violence, the simple morality of my dad's cowboy heroes suited me just fine. Jack Schaefer's Shane, in particular, about a gunslinger hero with a dark past, I read and reread in my adolescence. A dangerous hero trying to redeem himself and forego violence, but trapped by circumstance to strap on his guns once more and save the homesteaders from the evil cattle baron and then sacrifice himself to loneliness. Simple adventure, unambiguous heroism. It was a few years later after I'd reached a more complicated understanding of the world that I first stumbled on a novel by Frank O'Rourke called The Diamond Hitch not shelved with Max Brand and his cohorts, but residing, as I thought of it, on the real shelves with the real books. I was still smitten by Shane. For many years, he was my model for what a Western hero should be. But I read, when I read The Diamond Hitch two or three times in my teens, and I understood even then that it was more authentic in feeling in landscape, in the depth of its perceptions, more accurate in its details, and in the complexity of the lives of its characters than the traditional Western fiction I'd grown up loving. It was my first encounter with a writer nudging the mythology of the cowboy hero away from Shane's blood and bravery toward a darker, more complex truth. When Dewey Jones steps off the train in Holbrook, Arizona, in that novel, he's flat broke after a summer following the rodeo circuit. He lands work as a cook and a horsebreaker for a winter roundup. And, he, and this first long part of the novel follows Dewey and the rest of the roundup crew through days and weeks of hard, hot, exhausting, dusty, dangerous work there is very little of what could be called adventure. There is a great deal of detail about Dewey's work as a cook and as a horsebreaker 
and how he manages to find time for his horse breaking in between baking bread and stewing beans and lard in a Dutch oven. There are two Apaches working the roundup, though none of the other men remark on this in any particular way. There is no gunplay. Dewey has a gun in his bedroll, but he never brings it out. He doesn't even mention why he has it. And when he returns to the rodeo that summer after the roundup, it's to a nervous, bright, seductive world with its own dangers. His dreams of big wins perennially wrecked by late nights and too much bootleg liquor. There is a camp follower who enables Dewey's drinking, and after he sobers up and falls for the good woman, there's the man who is a rival for Mary Ashford's affections, and that is as close as O'Rourke comes to anything like a villain. This is not the, a West frozen in the amber of the 1880s, as 99% of Western novels are. It is the real and changing West of Model T Fords, moving pictures, and prohibition. When I began to write The Jump Off Creek, it was O'Rourke's novel, more than Shane, more than any other of the scores of Westerns that I had read over the years, that I sometimes consciously and sometimes unconsciously took as a model for Blue and Tim. I had Dewey Jones in mind, for instance, when I made Tim Whitaker a cowhand who bakes pies for his neighbors and takes off-season work as a cook for the logging crew. Blue is an Indian because of those Apaches who were unremarkable members of the Roundup crew in the Diamond Hitch. In this and in many other small details of Western life and work as I've written of it, I know that I owe a debt to the Diamond Hitch. I've spent my writing life trying to reimagine the cowboy hero, trying to steer clear, as O'Rourke did, of gunslingers and savages. But Shane cast his shadow over the jump off creek too, in the slow aggravation of conflict between Tim and the Wolfers and the fated working out of that story that male story. In the traditional Western novel, violence is the easy and only answer to every problem, no matter how complex. It's an answer without pain, without honest pain or consequences. It seems to me that the shadow of that violence, the shadow of the cowboy hero, has darkened our American politics our national identity, our values and beliefs. This is something I've spoken about often, and I spoke about it to this fish trap audience earlier this month. But I feel strongly that storytelling can not only help us witness ourselves as we are in the world, but also think in new ways, fresh ways, about who we might become. So when the men's story in the Jump Off Creek spirals into violence, it is not the cowboy hero's easy answer to conflict. Death is its painful consequence. When I've been asked to say what my novel is about, I have said often that it's a working out of the different ways men and women experienced the American West women's experience of home and community, accommodating to the landscape, women's notions about the heroism of ordinary lives, set against what is mostly a male mythology of violence and conflict. So now I want to talk about the women's stories, novels that showed me how to rewrite Western women's lives, novels that counted the cost of being a hero. Novels now forgotten, but in the er early years of the Western, the Western, were doing their best to shape a truer mythology of the West. They lost out to Max Brand and Luke Short, Louis L'Amour. 
In the 1980s, when I was at the beginning of my writing life, the feminist critics were beginning to speak about forgotten women writers, those gaps Heilbrunn spoke of. And as I was beginning to think about writing a Western novel about a single woman homesteader, Sue Armitage, who was living in Pullman at the time, put together a scholarly study about forgotten women writers, forgotten Western women, and her study pointed me to a certain kind of Western fiction I thought might be useful for my research. Westerns I had missed in all those years of reading cowboy novels. Westerns written by women around the end of the 19th century and the first decades of the 20th. Novels that have since fallen by the wayside, long forgotten and long out of print. I had to search out those novels in the stacks of the library and in out-of-the-way used bookstores. By the time I began writing The Jump Off Creek, I had read a fair number of them. I have one bookshelf in my house devoted to those old novels. The good news is they cost more now than they did when I first started to collect them <laughs> because other people have realized these are books they should be reading or collecting them. So in the early years of the Western, which would have been in the 1920s pretty much, they were building on the foundation of the post-Civil War dime novel. Writers like Zane Gray and Max Brand were hammering out what would become the traditional Western formula of heroic cowboys, gunslingers, Texas rangers, crooked sheriffs. Novels in which women were often completely absent or peripheral at best fragile things needing rescue, and after the rescue, the hero moseys along to his next adventure. That's where we get this phrase, you know, riding into the sunset. But in those very same years, on the same dime novel foundation, women were building a different tradition. Novels in which the conventions of the dime novel were contradicted or subverted in several important ways. For one thing, women writers were likely to create women protagonists. Um, they were absolutely missing from the men's stories, but they were central to the women's novels. And the heroine in women's westerns often wasn't a dainty ornamental decoration. She was physically fit. She was smart. Often she could ride like the men. Maybe she had a formal education, even college. In the books these women wrote, heroines had often headed west on their own to escape an ill-suited lover or to flee some tragic loss or misadventure in the civilized east. In courtship, these heroines often were clear-headed and rational. They didn't fall into a romantic swoon, but coolly took a look at the pros and cons of a marriage proposal. And if that reminds you of Lydia, you are not mistaken. And their heroes were often lonesome, not looking to ride off into the sunset, but looking for love, for companionship. They were often flawed, vulnerable in some way, needing the woman's advice or needing a woman's moral compass to conquer their own weaknesses. These heroines moved the plot along rather than taking the usual Western woman's role as a love object or a victim or a helpmate to a man. In fact, frequently, women protagonists were doing a man's job. They were daughters called on to run the ranch because their father was dead or if he was living, then crippled physically or emotionally or just a wastrel. These women writers threw in plenty of physical action, run, runaway, um, fistfights, floods, stampedes, but it's interesting to me that shootouts and gunplay were rare. The six-gun mystique that seems to characterize men's writing about the West was largely missing from these women's novels. Their books were essentially Western romances, and the romance plot, of course, required still requires a happy ending, which meant marriage and homemaking for the heroine. But the woman writers of Western romances stretched, bent, twisted that traditional ending 
to show us at least a heroine who wasn't driven into marriage by finances or by family, a girl in a position to choose her husband, and after marriage to be his partner, his companion, not as in so many men's westerns, something he possesses on a par with his horse or his saddle. In the most daring of these novels, the man suffers a tragic end and the woman carries on, or even goes farther west without him. In Mara Ellis Ryan's novel, Told in the Hills, a noble Indian friend to the dead hero watches over her from the nearby trees, protecting her from harm. But this was a woman who preferred the freedoms and risks of the frontier to the constraints and relative safety of a return to civilization. Told in the Hills is the novel Lydia receives in the mail from her mother. In these books, heroines question their traditional roles and expectations carved out for them because of their background, their class, or their ancestry. They are writing their own lives in Carolyn Hybron's terms. And in these books, often, there were plot turns that included serious women's problems. B.M. Bauer wrote of abandonment, divorce, wife beating. Gertrude Atherton of the difficult choice between love and career or raising a child and career. Mary Austin, among others, was concerned about desert and forest exploitation. Often there were honest and sympathetic portrayals of Native Americans, Californios, mixed bloods, as in Told in the Hills and in Mary Austin's work, as well as Mary Halleck Foote and Helen Hunt Jackson. They are old fashioned, most of them, in ways that Willa Cather's work, for instance, is not. But the best of them were written on the same model as Owen Wister's Virginian, exploring similar moral ambiguities. And I don't know why their work is no longer in print, no longer read, when the Virginian is still in print more than 100 years later. <clears throat> but Carolyn Heiblin's theory about gaps in literature is as close as I can come to understanding it. The Jump Off Creek, as I first conceived it, would have been a heroic novel of the sort I had read in my childhood. I planned to just put a woman in the hero's role. But the Jump Off Creek, as it came to be written, was shaped not only by the letters and memoirs of homesteading women, the ones I spoke about a couple weeks ago for Fish Trap, but also by these many novelists who had come before me. Frank O'Rourke, working in a smaller, quieter corner of the West, a place where the heroism and the violence were downplayed, half concealed in the mundane details of a hard life, and by those turn-of-the-century Western romances in which the best values of the Western myth, the courage, the self-reliance, the toughness, were always mindfully upheld. For the two years that I was at work on the Jump Off Creek, I considered that the book might have to be a sort of gift to Lydia Sanderson and all the women who had been her models, that I might be writing it as Lydia and her peers had written their diaries just to please and instruct myself. I had a science fiction agent. Um, in the 1980s, there were no Western films being made. Louis L'Amour owned the book market. There were no markets for Western short fiction. I hadn't, hadn't seen a, a modern novel about the West in a decade at least or more. I knew Jump Off Creek was a serious book, but I thought it would be perceived as not Louis L'Amour, not a paperback Western, but not serious Western literature either. I wasn't sure if anyone would even want to read it. But here we are, 34 years later. Lydia's book has been in print continuously from the same publisher. The publisher, as it happens, and not by coincidence, was A.B. Guthrie Jr.'s publisher and Willa Cather's. And many more people than I expected have been willing to read a Western that doesn't end in a marriage. <laughs> or have some, have some people have complained to me, a Western that doesn't end at all. <laughs> but endings, you know, 
are for romance and daydreams, not for life. I have some good news about contemporary uh, writers of the West. There has been uh, quite a bit of new scholarly attention to the writers that I've been talking about today. Uh, Norris Yates, for one, wrote a book all about these women, um, exploring each of them and the reasons why their books should be read, um, the ways in which they had subverted and changed and undermined the usual tropes of Western fiction. Collectors value them now, as I mentioned earlier. The books now cost quite a bit more than they used to, if you can find them at all. And some mid-century women writers of the West who had fallen out of print have been reprinted by university presses. Um, Mildred Walker, for one, all of her Western novels are back in print. Meridelle Lesseur, another one from the mid-50s who's back in print. Um, Lots more attention is being paid to women's memoirs, memoirs of Western women especially. Mary Foote's memoir, Mary Halleck Foote, her memoir, which was unpublished until recent decade, I don't know when, does anyone know? 15 years ago maybe, it came back into print, it came into print, it had never been in print, um, and was largely the, um, the, f the source for um, staff, uh, help me, Betty. Stegner. Stegner, thank you, thank you. You aren't Betty, but thank you. Um, <laughs> for Wallace Stegner's Angle of Repose. Um, his, his novel, half of his novel is pretty much cribbed from Mary Halleck Foote's memoir. Um, and her memoir finally is, is in print. Um, Mara Ellis Ryan's novel, Told in the Hills, is still not reprinted, but since the Jump Off Creek, lots, there have been lots more new, serious novels written by women about women in the West, by both men and women, actually. I love Kent Harreff's work, Eventide and Plain Song, which are contemporary novels about, about uh, Eastern Colorado. Um, Jeanette Walls, her novel Half Broke Horses, which was based, I think, on her grandmother. Jane Kirkpatrick, of course, you all know her work. Um, Karen Fisher, I reviewed her book. It's called A Sudden Country. Um, Mary Clearman Blue and, and Pam Houston and Kim Barnes and Marilyn Robinson, all of them have been publishing novels in recent years. Um, a woman named S.M. Hulse, H-U-L-S-E, her novel Black River is about the contemporary West. Rebecca Claren, uh, her novel Kick Down is about, um, I think it's Colorado. Um, uh, where they're mining the, sh or looking for oil in the shale. Is that right? Am I saying that right? Um, and of course, Betty Husted, All Coyotes Children. Um, Linda Hogan, her novel Sol Solar Storms. Um, so I'm encouraged that, you know, when I wrote the jump and published The Jump Off Creek, it was the only, the first novel um, written about women in the West in decades, since, since the 1950s probably. Um, and now it's not standing alone. It's standing up with all these other writers coming along who are, who are looking at women in the West. So that's the good news I have to bring to you. Um, and that's all I brought to talk to you about today. So now it's open for you to ask me questions and keep this conversation going. <clears throat> Thank you. I wasn't sure I was going to be able to see anybody's hand with the <laughs> glaring light. Waiting to see if this, everybody can hear me okay. Hi. So uh, if you have a question, raise your hand. I'll come over with the mic. But I, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I have the mic uh, and ask a question of you while you take a drink of water. I was wondering what advice you would give to writers now about how to tell the stories that they don't see represented their own stories that you went through the journey you went through finding you know not seeing women's stories what advice would you give to writers today about finding how what's um, that process well maybe i can just speak to in, in particular about a particular writer um 
I'm, I'm teaching now in the low residency MFA program for Pacific University. So I have uh, usually, you know, they, they have two residencies a year where it's 10 days of really intense togetherness. But then I work with two or three or four writers over the course of a semester um, through email and, um, you know, they send me work and I send back my, my notes about that work. Um, we have at least five exchanges of material that way over the course of a semester. And I have had a couple of writers in that program who have been writing about the contemporary West or, the, or just the rural parts of, of, uh, of this country. The, um, one writer that I'm thinking of now who is writing a, a serious novel um, set in the, she's made up a name for the town, but it's basically Skakus. Um, you know, on the lower Columbia River. And um, she's uh, dealing with all kinds of issues to, deal, to do with um, the, uh, the, you know, the impact, the, the power that is wielded by the logging uh, people and by the shipping companies there and um, the issues around incarceration. She's got a whole slew of issues that she's dealing with. It's a complicated novel. She's tackling a lot of stuff, and and we had a lot. I had a lot to say about it. She's got a long way to go before this book ever gets to the point of um, submitting for a publication. But I'm so encouraged that she's that she's wanting to write that because she, she lives there. She lives on the hills above Scapus. She wants to write about the things that she knows. It's fiction. It's a novel but she's got characters in it that are based on her, on her own knowledge and on uh, relatives. Um, and so I tell her, this is an important novel. It's important that you get it right. Um, I'm helping her, I hope, to get there. But I'm also warning her, you know, that this is not an easy sell. It's, it's about a rural part of Oregon, uh, a small town, it's, it's dealing with issues that people often don't want to hear about, don't want to confront. And uh, the publishing world right now is rough. It's hard to get published. Um, and I tell them that. But I also tell them this is important, and it's important that you're doing it. And um, the, good, the good part of the publishing world, I think, is that lots of smaller presses are stepping up where the, the big houses in New York are stepping back. Um, they're public, they want to publish the novel that they know is going to sell a million copies. They don't want to uh, take an author who's only going to sell 5,000 copies. But the smaller presses are more willing, and the university presses, are more willing to take a chance on a writer who's uh, writing important work um, and not going to sell a lot, a lot of copies. I do feel for myself, because the two more novels of mine that I feel are pushing against the cowboy mythology. Uh, Hearts of Horses and, and Falling from Horses are both novels that are pushing, trying to nudge the cowboy mythology away from Shane a bit and looking at the dark underbelly of that mythology. And I often, personally often feel that I'm shouting into the void, you know. Um, so. I understand that a writer like the one I'm working with, um, she may feel the same. You know, she's she's got stuff she wants to say, and she wants to reach an audience, and she she may find that the audience isn't there. I don't know. It's hard. Thank you, Molly. Uh, raise your hand if you have a question, and I'll come to you. Ah. <laughs> I'm, should I hold it? Oh, you got it, okay. Uh, um, I'm curious if there are any uh, Western films that inspired you in your writing. Oh, yeah. And if so, what those films might be and how you think women were represented in those films. Mm -hmm. The one film you should all see, and I was hoping actually that Fish Trap would have gotten a copy and <laughs> made it part of this program, um, uh, is called Heartland. Has anybody else seen that film? Yeah, a few of you have, Heartland. 
I think it's the best film out there about the kind of thing that I'm talking about, um, the hardship of the life, but also centering a woman. Um, it's, you can probably find it, you know, you have to look a little bit. I'm not sure who has it. If you have, do you have Canopy with a K? You know, it's through the library system usually, a, a, a way of renting movie or getting movies to watch on your TV, stream, stream movies, Canopy with a K. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm afraid it is. Um, which is, you know, here we are back to the dark side of, of the of these messages getting out because Heart, Heart, Heartland is really a wonderful, wonderful film, and it's the only one really that I would highly recommend that centers a woman. There have been, of course, um, movies that centered a woman where they put they basically just strap a gun on the woman, you know, and she does the things that the cowboy hero would have done. Um, there are the movies that, where they tried to count the cost of being a hero, you know, like um, Clint Eastwood, is it Clint Eastwood who did Unforgiven? Yeah. Um, you know, that's a kind of a dark film showing the fallout of, of violence. And, and, and that's an improvement in some ways for me, but it's still, um, I think there's a lot of people who see Unforgiven and still see it as uh, uh, glorifying the violence. I think there's, you can still watch it and feel that. Um, so, you know, there's not a lot out there. Um, they did, they did, did they make a movie out of Plain Song? Did they? No, I guess not. It, you're kidding. No, it's not. Really? No, that's not it. No, that's a different Heartland. Um, Heartland. Heartland stars uh, Rip Torn and Conchata Farrell. So when you're looking, because you know there are other things out there with that title, it's Conchata Farrell and Rip Torn. Yes, Molly. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, here behind the mask. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you had any reflections you'd want to share. You mentioned two of your other books that didn't do as well as The Jump Off Creek, and any reflections on why that is? They were telling us, you know, also pushing against that mythology, but what may or may not be different about those two? Okay. Well, actually, I may have misled you, because The Hearts of Horses is far more popular <laughs> than Jump Off Creek. It is the most popular of all the novels I've written. Um, and still in print and still selling tons. I still get, you know, quarterly royalty checks from, from Hearts of Horses. What I mean to say about that is that people read it for the story um, and they don't get it. They don't get what I was trying to say uh, about, um, it, it's a novel about a, a young woman who's breaking horses for some farmers and ranchers in, um, in a, a fictional county that is based on Willow County. Willow County was too big for my purposes, so I shrunk it a little bit. Um, and then I looked at my Oregon map to see where I could put my fictional county, and I pushed some things out of the way <laughs> to, to make room for Elwha County, and I plopped it down uh, south of Pendleton, north of John Day, uh, west of Baker City, um, east of Prineville, and there it is. Um, so you all know exactly where it is, right? But it is Wallowa County. It's a shrunken version of Wallowa County, which you will recognize if you've read the novel. Um, about a single woman homesteader in 1917 who is breaking horses for a bunch of farmers and ranchers. And she is like I was when I was 15. She's in love with Shane, I would say. She dresses um, like, the, like the women in the rodeos in that, in that day, in 1917, you know, the women who dressed in their um, fringe chaps and, you know, fancy clothes. She dresses like that. She thinks that she wants to be an itinerant cowboy. She thinks she will never marry. She does not think that Elwha County is the real West. 
it's because it's too familiar to her. And she thinks the real West must be out there somewhere, maybe Arizona or you know, the hidden canyons of a Zane Grey novel. Um, and it's only over the course of the novel that she comes to see um, the world a little bit differently, to see, um, to fall in love for one thing. I finally let one of my girls fall in love <laughs> and get married. Um, and, and she, um, at the very end of the novel, here's why I know that I'm speaking in the void. Um, because at the very end of that novel, um, I jump way ahead, and it's Martha in her old age. And she's talking to her granddaughter in her old age. And her granddaughter says, it's, it's so amazing, Grandma, that you were alive when Buffalo Bill was doing his, uh, his circus act. And at the other end of it, you saw the nuclear tests in Nevada in one lifetime. You, you saw both of those things. And isn't that amazing? And I have Martha say, well, honey, um, we, we uh, what did I say? We, we lost our cowboy, we killed our cowboy myth ourselves. You know, we, we killed our cowboy dreams ourselves. And I have had, I can't tell you how many people ask me, what did I mean by that? You know, when they come to that line, they want to know what I meant by it. And I want them to have read the novel in such a way that they knew exactly what she meant. Um, and it, it saddens me that people have asked me that question. Um, is that, oh, um, uh, but, I, but further, um, Falling from Horses uh, is the last of those novels. And that one is, a, is really drilling down even farther into the cowboy myth because it is set in 1937-38 in Hollywood. Uh, a young man who goes south to, um, to be a stunt writer in the cowboy movies. And so it's very much about the influence of the cowboy films on our understanding of the West. I think the films, even more than the novels, have had a really deleterious effect on, on the cowboy mythology. And, and that novel, I was really trying to get at that, to, to show the f fake, the falseness of the cowboy films and how, um, how awful they were in every way, uh, in the way they treated the men, the, the stunt men, and the way they treated the horses, all the animals, but particularly the horses. Um, and that novel has not sold well at all. Um, I think it's too hard for people to be confronted with that kind of um, reality. Um, we all want, we want to, we're still in love with Shane, and he's the man that our mothers warned us against. <laughs> um. Anybody else? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, just a quick question, um, uh, the usual one, I guess. Um, what, what are you working on now? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not working on a novel. I won't be writing any more novels. I got a big laugh uh, at the library in La Grande yesterday when I said this. I am the same age as old people. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I've written six novels, and they, I'm a very slow writer. I'm, it takes me a long time to write a novel. And it's gotten harder, not easier, with time. And I think that's partly, I, I hope it's because I've been trying to reach for harder things each time. I don't want to repeat myself each novel. So uh, it's taken me longer and longer to finish a novel. Six years would not be un, you know, uncommon. And I don't want to be in my 90s out there schlepping a book into bookstores, you know, I don't. Uh, but more than that, I don't want to be um, slogging to the end of writing a novel in my 90s. And I have two grandchildren. I have, uh, I have a life. I have a busy life. And um, so I'm not writing a novel, and no more novels. So if you want to read Molly Gloss, you have to read one of those books that are already out there. Um, I am writing poetry. I'm in a poetry group with, group with Betty and uh, five other people, and 
women, and um, I have to keep writing poetry because otherwise my group won't let me keep coming. Um, <laughs> um, so I am writing poetry. It's not my, I don't think it's my natural gift, but I do think I've written a few poems that are okay, that are good. Um, so, so I still write poetry. I have two short stories that I have hopes of someday finishing. Um, they sit in my file and I work on them every once in a while and sometimes I go months not looking at them and then I pull out the file and look at it and I think, well, this is really good, I should finish this. <laughs> and then I close the file and <laughs> go away again. Uh, but I think I will, I, eventually I will, I think, publish a couple more stories, so. And they are sort of that, uh, intersection between the West and science fiction. And I have, uh, I have a reputation actually in science fiction in short fiction. So I have no trouble publishing there. If I write a short story that has something weird in it, um, I have editors who are wait waiting to publish a Molly Gloss weird story. So. <laughs> So you were talking about Elwha County that you created. Right. Um, in Jump Off Creek, you have it in a very specific location. Um, you name very specific mm -hmm. uh, communities that a right. actually exist. <clears throat> Meacham, yeah. Yeah. Legrand. Um, and Legrand. Um, how, I, I guess I'd like to hear you speak to how specific you were in doing the research for where you were placing it, how much was just sort of arising in your imagination, um, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, um, the, the very beginning origin of the Jump Off Creek was, um, was out of Legrand, up on Mount Emily, out of Legrand. Um, our family, we, were, we did a lot of hiking and camping back then when I had a husband and a little, and a son. And we were camping at Emigrant Springs State Park, um, one of our favorite places, actually. And we were hiking in the, in the blues, and you know that country over there is pretty ridgy. You know, we went down into a ravine, um, and at the bottom of the ravine, which I, if I remember right, was probably on Meacham Creek. And, and down at the bottom of the ravine along the creek bank was a, a, a little cabin that was composting into the ground, you know, just dying. And, and I looked at that cabin and I went, what the hell were they thinking? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, that, and I knew even then, you know, that in those, in those days, um, you know, pretty much virtually every 160 acre parcel in the American West was, was occupied and had a house on it, you know. Uh, these were these homesteaders who were misled into thinking they could make a living somehow. But down in this canyon, you know, um, how did they imagine that they were ever going to make a living down there? And that was the beginning. That was the beginning for me of thinking about who could have thought that and who could have been down there and Anyway, that was the beginning of, of Lydia. And, and so I put her in roughly in that area because it was where I had gotten the idea in the first place. And it was a, a landscape that I was familiar with because we had hiked there so often and camped there. And so what I did then was similar to what I did but on a smaller scale to what I did with Hearts of Horses. I looked at at the map and saw Meacham and Legrand and Somerville and you know, and just um, put uh, Tim and Blue and and Lydia in an area that you know where I don't know um, where there's nobody that I know of that lived lived there, but I put them there. Um, so around in the same way with with the Hearts of Horses, everything around my fictional characters is real, is a real place, and is oriented to them the way it would be if my people really lived there. And so Meacham, you know, is uh, west and slightly north of where Lydia and Tim and Blue live. Um, and as with Hearts of Horses, I, 
I do that sort of thing, create a fictional place, in part because, you know, I know a lot of people in Willow County, actually, and I don't want any of you to come up to me and say, you know, <laughs> he didn't live there. <laughs> So, so I make up these fictional places. And we all know that you would, so yes. <laughs> I have time for one more question, I think, and then we'll, yep. Thank you very much. Uh, you've reminded me of a theme from a long time ago. Uh, I used to read one topic per year. In one year, I read only books by women. And um, when you talked about the, uh, um, or when Worcester's the, the, Virginian, the Virginian, she didn't want the adventure to end by getting married. She was very reluctant <laughs> to accept him. And I think about all the books that I read by women during that year, and they were all nonfiction, and they wanted the adventure. They were on this great adventure, mm -hmm. and they weren't willing, didn't want to have it suddenly end by marriage, house, responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Anne LaBastille wrote Woods Woman, uh, Robin Davidson. They were, they, they were on a great adventure. And so uh, I, I forgot th that part of why I read them. And well, so thank you the, very much for reminding me. At the end me. of The Virginian, she's the one who is complaining because he is, is m doing more paperwork now than anything to do with cattle and horses. Um, they're married, and he's just, he's made a good choice in choosing land that, of course, is uh, over a coal mine. You know, he's gonna he's become uh, basically a a corporate um, person, and she's re you know regretful that he's no longer the guy she married. He's um, you know he as she puts it does more paperwork than 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 ranch work. Um. <laughs> but you know, the Virginian, the Virginian was a very influential novel, and the traditional cowboy novels diverged after the Virginian because there were a large number of writers who didn't like the ending of the Virginian, that the, that the marriage was the end of his picaresque adventures, you know. They didn't like that, and that that's, was the beginning in many ways of those writers like Max Brand, Luke Short, Zane Grey, whose, whose heroes ride off without the woman at the end. They don't, they don't marry because marriage is the end of their adventures. And, but on the other half of that, there was another group of writers who read The Virginian who saw some of the complexity there. And so a writer, <coughs> a writer like A.B. Guthrie Jr., for instance, took off from the Virginian in a different direction that was more complex, more mature, um, looking at some of the dark side of, of the West, of, of what happened in the West. Um, so it really was a dividing point, the Virginian was. Were you wanting to call it up? Thank you. Well, thank you again, Molly and Betty and all of you. Uh, that's officially the wrap up of this year's Fish Trap Reads. And believe it or not, our winter programming, because I hear tell that it's actually spring. <laughs> I jinxed it, didn't I? But we're not done yet. So uh, join us next Friday night here at 7 p.m. for the Women, Words, and Music concert right here in this stage. Some of the performers I see in the room right now. Uh, this will be in joint with the Wallowa Valley Music Alliance and the Giuseppe Center. And is that being live streamed? Do we know yet? It will be available on recording. We think it will be live streamed. So if you're watching, come and join us for that. Then the following Friday on April 7th, we keep busy here. On the following Friday, we actually wrap up, if you can believe that, the 10th season of Fish Trap Fireside with readings from Ingrid Cook, Kendrick Moholt, 
Holt and Cam Scott, so you'll want to be here for that. There's a bunch more online, but before you take off tonight, please take time to speak with Molly and talk to say hi to Betty. And the Becky has books, including the Hearts of Horses. I see back there if you want to pick up a book. There is pie from Sugar Time Bakery. I wish all you on Facebook could be here for that. And Jennifer Hobbs made pie. And Hunter is back there selling adult libations, so please join us. And thank you for joining us tonight. Good night.